Okay, well, thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be uh, have, having this opportunity of talking to you about this uh, project I've been working on for a long time now with uh, Thierry Baudineau, who's in the Ecole Polytechnique, and Laure Saint-Raymond, who's in um, at the Ecole Normale in Lyon, and Sergio Simnella, who's also in the Ecole Normale in, uh, in Lyon. So, uh, yeah, so what we're trying to do is uh, understand something which uh, turns around Hilbert's sixth problem, and the general idea is to wonder uh, how you can derive fluid mechanics equations from particle systems, right? So you see your fluid as just lots of particles, and you can write down the equations on each of the particles, which we'll be doing in a minute. And the general question is, is it possible by some kind of average averaging procedure, taking means and a, lot, a large number of particles to find fluid mechanics equations like the I don't know, compressible Euler equations or, for instance, some compressible Navier-Stokes equations? So that's the general framework uh, of the problem. But uh, today I won't be talking about this uh, limit from particles to fluids, which is uh, widely unknown and open. Having the general theorem from particles to fluids is totally open. But uh, the general approach to derive fluid mechanics equations from particles is to use um, the Boltzmann equation. It's kind of an intermediate uh, model uh, somewhere between particles and fluids. And uh, deriving the Boltzmann equation from particles is, is in itself is, uh, quite hard and nothing much is known. Uh, not, not much progress has been made since the 70s, essentially, uh, and Lanford's theorem. So what I'll be talking about today is exactly that, trying to understand Lanford's uh, proof and try to go beyond his, his proof and understand fluctuations around the Boltzmann equation or large deviations. And the idea is that the more we understand that limit, then maybe the more we'll be able to go all the way to, to fluids. Okay, so that's the general framework uh, of my talk. So let me just go right now to the particle system. So please stop me whenever you like, right? Uh, I can't see most of you, so don't just stop me whenever it's unclear. Uh, so, okay, so let's start with the microscopic model. So the easiest thing you can think of is consider all the molecules which are forming your fluid to be just identical spheres with some radius, which I'll be calling epsilon here. That's the radius of my particles, which will be, of course, very, very small. And all the particles are identical. I'll just give them a label, but the label is just a choice I make here, uh, going from one to n, for instance. n is the number of particles. And uh, the equation is simply, uh, again, the simplest you can think of. The um, time average of the position here is simply the velocity of my particle. And I'm assuming here there's no exterior force on my bottle, so the velocity is a constant. Of course, it's a constant as long as my particles don't uh, cross each other. They're not allowed to cross. They can just collide. And so they collide when the diameter, when, well, when two uh, particles, their distance is exactly the diameter of my particles, which is epsilon here. So as, as long as the distance between the centers of each particle is larger than epsilon, the velocity is constant. And then what can happen, of course, is that at some time they do touch each other. And in that case, if they're going in, so the V primes here mean my velocities are going inwards, my particles are going to touch, then they're going to bounce just like a billiard, so with a perfect billiards uh, spectral re reflection. And then you can compute the incoming velocities in terms of the outgoing ones or in the other way around, it's an involution here, by this formula which is, uh, it looks maybe horrible, but very simple. It's just a usual Newton's law, uh, sorry, uh, specular uh, reflection laws, or Descartes or Huygens laws. Uh, the one over epsilon squared here is just because I need to normalize the unit normal vector between my particles. Okay, I sign minus xj is a size epsilon. I have two of them, so I have an epsilon squared here. Is that okay? So don't don't try to remember those formulas if you've never seen them before. Maybe all you can maybe remember that might use, be useful later on is that the momentum and the energy of my system is conserved. Okay, whenever there's a collision, all I, my particles have mass one to make things simple. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the whole system of equations which describes exactly what's going on in my particle system. But of course, you have a lot of equations. And I mentioned D, I have uh, uh, D equations for the position, D equations for the velocity, and then I have N particles, so ND equations, two ND equations. Uh, that's, of course, much too much. And on the other hand, we're not really interested in knowing where each particle is, is at each time. So we want to average out this in some way to find fluid mechanics uh, at some point, but at least for today, the Boltzmann equation. So the Boltzmann equation is telling you uh, that's Boltzmann's statement, uh, what the distribution of particles have 
position x at velocity v for some time t. So here x is in, let's say, the torus. OK, that's essentially to make things simple. It could be the whole space. But for the moment, it can't be anything else. But we can talk about that later on, if you like. And v here is in the whole space. It's a velocity. And t is any positive number, a real number. And so f is a function of t, x, and v. And it's telling you the density of particles, which at time t have uh, position x and velocity v. And what Boltzmann is telling you here is that this um, function f is going to satisfy a transport equation, which is sort of normal because my particles are being transported by their velocity. And then on the right hand side, you see a term which is called a collision term, which is uh, telling you that particles are not going just as free flows, but they are uh, meeting each other by binary collisions. OK, one thing I haven't mentioned here is that I'm only assuming my collisions are binary. OK, so if I have three particles meeting uh, at some point, it's not too hard to prove that it's very unlikely. The set of initial data creating such an event would be a measure of zero. So we just forget about that in the particle system and only look at binary collisions. OK, so Q of FF is remembering that my original system had those binary collisions. And here's the formula. So this is exactly the uh, Boltzmann equation. And let me just go through slowly maybe the right-hand side. So the right-hand side, you see those f primes, f prime ones. It's not a de derivative of f, definitely not. f prime just means I'm computing f at velocity v prime, OK? And um, v prime is computed from v by a scattering law. So essentially, what this right-hand side is telling you is that you can pick randomly a velocity v1. OK, so I integrate over v1. And what happens is that if a, a particle of velocity v it hits a particle of velocity v1, I'm going to create a particle with another velocity. OK, for the par particle hasn't changed, but its velocity has changed. So it doesn't con contribute to the distribution of particles at velocity v. That's why I have a minus sign here. OK, if a particle of velocity v hits another one of velocity v1, then I've lost the particle of velocity v because of the, of the scattering. On the other hand, so again, I take any uh, particle of velocity v1. What can happen is that a particle of velocity v prime hits a particle of velocity v prime 1, and that creates a particle of velocity v. So that's why I have a plus sign here. OK. So the right-hand side of my equation is telling me how I can create a particle of velocity v or how I can lose a particle of velocity v. And then uh, the strength of this creation or this loss is given by this cross-section here, which could be 0 if my particles are just uh, grazing. v minus v1 is orthogonal to x1 minus x2, which is given by this uh, omega here, which is normalized. So omega here is on the sphere. And this is the strongest if v minus v1 is orthogonal. Sorry, if v minus v1 is orthogonal, it's a zero, OK? Because v minus v1 is like this, and x1 minus x2 is like that, if you can see v. And this is maximum if they're parallel, which means exactly that they're, it's a head-on collision, right? v minus v1 is parallel to x1 minus x2. And what is alpha? Good question. Alpha is the strength of my collisions. As you're remembering, so I'll try, maybe I'll give you, I'll say that in a second. If alpha is zero, you have free transport, no collisions. If alpha is very, very large, you have a lot of collisions. So it's telling you essentially how many uh, collisions one particle will have in time one. Okay, and that's sort of a choice. It's a physical parameter. And actually, if you want to find a fluid mechanics equation, you should let alpha go to infinity. Okay, so it's like the inverse uh, mean free path. Okay. So this is the Boltzmann equation. Uh, now, the question is, how do you go from particles to Boltzmann? But maybe just for a second, let me tell you a few words about the Boltzmann equation before we move on to a Lanford's theorem. So uh, maybe you can just try to see what uh, is inherited in this equation from the original particle system, what is conserved in this equation. So if you want to find conservations, what you should do is multiply your equation by some test function. Let's make it just depend on v to simplify, integrate over v. And if the right-hand side is 0, when you do that, then this quantity will be a locally uh, um, conserved in sense. It will be transported. Okay, I multiply the equation by this. If the right-hand side is zero, then f phi will be trans um, satisfied a transport equation. Now, if you remember uh, your Q of ff, you see you could symmetrize v and v1. If you integrate over v, then v and v1 have the same role to play. So if I multiply by phi, it's the same as, as one half of multiplying by phi of v plus phi of v1. What you're going to also do is exchange v v1 in, uh, against v prime v prime 1. If you do that, all signs changes change. So in the end, using those symmetries, you get one quarter 
because you've used uh, three more symmetries. And then you can have either phi of v plus phi of v1 or minus phi v prime minus phi v prime. Okay, so now the question is, when is this thing zero? Well, this thing is zero, of course, if phi plus phi one minus phi prime minus phi prime one is zero. Okay, when does that happen? Well, you see it happens if phi is a constant, obviously, because one plus one minus one minus one is zero. That happens if phi is equal to v because of a conservation of momentum, v plus v one is equal to v prime plus v prime one. And it's equal to zero if phi is equal to v squared because of the conservation of energy. Okay. And actually, you can prove that's the only case, but I, I won't go through that unless you, you ask me to. But uh, under quite mild assumptions, you can approve, prove the only way for the, this guy q phi to be equal to zero for any f is for phi to be exactly a combination of a constant v or v squared. Okay, and that's exactly the way that conservation of density, momentum, and energy is translated at the level of the Boltzmann equation. Okay. Now, if you look at this formula here in the middle of the slide and you replace phi, if you could, by log of f. So uh, f is a probability distribution, I should have said, so it's non-negative, you can compute its log. And if you do that and you use the fact that x log x is uh, convex, then you find that this q of ff log of f is always negative. Or uh, d of f, which is the entropy, um, sorry, um, the entropy f log f here, has to be decaying because this, this d of f here is uh, positive with a minus sign. Okay, so what I'm saying here is that just a, um, this is a heuristic argument, right? You have to prove things, of course, but formally, f log f will always be decreasing in time. That's known as the H theorem by Boltzmann. Okay, um, what you can also notice uh, because of this decrease in time is that the Boltzmann equation is time irreversible because this quantity is decreasing. Whereas the particle system was reversible in time, right? If you if you look at a billiards, a perfect billiards, and you just play the film backwards, nothing goes wrong. Put t into minus t, all the velocities are switched to their minus, and then everything is fine again. So the particle system is time reversible. The Boltzmann equation is time irreversible, and so going from one to the other has to be a sort in some in some way complicated, or something has to happen because you're going from a reversible to irreversible irreversible system. So you have to understand what's going on in some sense. We'll go back to that later on. Now, in the case where there is no loss of entropy, that means in particular Q of FF log of F has to be equal to zero, right? Because you don't want this entropy to decay. And if you go back to what I said before, that means that log of F has to be either a constant, a V or V squared. Okay, and if F is an L1 because it's a probability distribution, then the constant here has to be negative. And so you get uh, a Maxwellian. Okay, which you can simplify, take b equal to zero, a equal to one, just to make uh, a equal to zero to make things as simple as possible. This is the global Maxwellian normalized. And this guy is a conserved quantity for our system. Okay, so all you might want to remember about uh, Boltzmann is that it has some conserved quantities, which are not very regular quantities, just averaging against one v or v squared. And there's this quantity here, the Gaussian, which is a constant, which actually cancels every term of the equation separately. Okay, now uh, what's known uh, going from um, particles to Boltzmann? So as I said, what you're gonna do is let epsilon, the diameter of my particles go to zero. And at the same time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let the number of particles go to infinity. And the scaling we're going to use, and here's alpha coming in here, is the following. The scaling is telling you that one particle, any particle roughly, if it's moving at velocity one in time one, is gonna cross alpha particles. Why is that? Because uh, if it's moving with time one, velocity one, it's going to, um, to cover a tube of uh, volume epsilon d minus one, okay, which is the picture here. And so if, if you want that to, to, if you want your particle to have alpha um, collisions, that means this tube should be the size of this tube times n, which is the number of particles should be equal to alpha. Okay, if alpha is equal to one, essentially one particle will hit another one in time one. The larger the alpha, the more, the more collisions there are. Okay, so this uh, sort of gives you the definition of alpha. And now, uh, when do you know that there is a limit from particles to Boltzmann? Well, it's been known since Lanford that uh, there is some kind of uh, convergence. I'll be giving you a statement, of course, later on. 
the drawback of his theorem, which is uh, we haven't, and no one has been able to do better in general uh, since then, is that the time on which this works is of the order one over alpha. Okay, we'll see why later on. And so you see, if you want to get fluid, you need to get alpha going to infinity. And so Lanford's theorem just breaks down. So that's why we can't go from particles to fluids because you can't go from particles to Boltzmann with an alpha as large as you like, okay, because of this drawback here. Except for special cases, like if you have only one particle, which is not at equilibrium, all the other ones are, then you can do much better. But in our situation today, where we want a nonlinear equation, so not a tag particle, but every particle is uh, distributed according to some function f, then uh, Lanford's theorem, so the derivation of the Boltzmann equation, is only known for a very, very small time when alpha goes to infinity. Uh, so uh, today, that's really what we want to understand. Uh, can we understand better uh, Lanford's proof? Can we understand the fluctuations around Lanford's proof or around Boltzmann to try to understand if in any way, but that the answer is, I don't know, if any way we could do better than a Lanford's theorem. Okay, that's a, a long-term project for the moment. The only project we want, we have is uh, understanding fluctuations, large deviations around Boltzmann's equation. Okay, so to do that, I don't need alpha. Alpha can be equal to one because that's not our problem here. We won't try to, today we're not gonna improve Lanford's theorem at all. We just want to you know, understand it a little bit better. So since I don't want to improve uh, the time of convergence, everything will be very short time. I'll just fix alpha equal to one. I, I won't bother about alpha at all in this talk. Right, so let, now let's try to see how we go from particles to Boltzmann. So what I'm going to do uh, today, since we want to understand fluctuations, uh, so that means I want to understand uh, what uh, correlations are brought in my system. And uh, so as we see, uh, Boltzmann is essentially saying that our, all particles are independent. If I want to understand fluctuations, I need to understand correlations between particles. And so one thing I'm not going to do is fix the number of particles. I'm going to say the number of particles is unknown. And it's going to satisfy a Poisson distribution, as we'll see in a second. Okay, so all my particles are sitting in this phase space, which is telling me that uh, distribution function is a function of the collection of all um, positions, the collection of all velocities, capital XN, capital VN. Okay, and the, co the collection of, of uh, positions has to be set, as, set as in this phase space here where the distance between two particles has to be larger than epsilon. So my phase space is the whole space, modulo the fact that they can't cross. Okay, so it's a domain with lots of holes in some sense. And so my initial data is the following. I'm going to assume all my particles are identically distributed, which means that they all follow this density F0, which is a nice function, continuous function, uh, probability distribution. Okay, that's the, the first assumption I'm going to make. They're all identically distributed with F0. The second assumption I'm going to make is that the number of particles is not known, but I know it's given by some kind of Poisson distribution, which is here where mu epsilon will, will be the average number of particles. And since I told you that n epsilon d minus one should be equal to one, the average number of particles is given by one over epsilon d minus one. Okay, so this is fixed. That's the average number of particles. And now the last thing I need to remember is that my phase space is this space full of holes. So I need to guarantee that my Zn's are living in that space. Okay, so once I do that, I have this partition function at epsilon, which is not only exponential of mu epsilon, if I just had the Poisson process minus mu epsilon, but I have, of course, also the volume of this domain here. Okay, so I normalize everything with this uh, z epsilon, and this is my initial data. So just remember, all my particles are identically distributed up to the fact that they're living in this phase space with lots of holes, and then the number of particles is given by this uh, Poisson distribution. Is that okay? So I'll call w my initial probability density, and that's what I'm going to work on. Initially, I know exactly what's going on. Now, the question is, what happens as time evolves? What happens to this uh, W? Well, what happens to W is quite obvious. It's just transported by the flow, right? Because my particles are transported. So you remember that in, uh, by the UV equation, which is here, a simple transport. The only difficulty in this transport equation is that it's set in this domain with all those uh, holes, x i minus x j is larger than epsilon. So I have lots of boundary conditions. Okay, and the boundary conditions are going to tell me that if at some, if I find myself on the boundary, which means that xi minus xj for some i and j is equal to epsilon, which also means that vi, vi minus vj dot xi minus xj is, um, is positive. Okay, if it's negative, everything is fine. I mean, my particles are moving far from each other and I, I know what's going on. If it's positive, I don't know what to do. 
what I have to do is replace VI and VJ by V prime I, V prime J. Remember, V prime I, V prime J. So if I find myself at a position in phase space where two particles are very close in some sense, X I minus X J is epsilon, and they're outgoing, then I have to prescribe their velocities by what they were just before the scaling. That's the definition of the boundary condition for this equation. Okay. So now I know if I solve this equation, I know exactly what the configuration of my, of my system is at any time t. Now, where is Lanford? Lanford is going to tell you, or where is Boltzmann? It's going to tell you what, what the distribution of one particle is. Particle number one, for instance. The labels of my particles are totally, uh, uh, I mean, my functions are all, can be, you can change the labels. They're all symmetric with, uh, with respect to permutations. Let's just say I want to look at particle number one, for instance. So I want to look at the one particle correlation function. Okay, the one particle correlation function, which is defined here, is just uh, integrating, well, one way of understanding it is you take the empirical distribution, so take any test function H, average out with respect to my initial uh, distribution. So writing E epsilon actually means I'm summing over N, I'm taking uh, this sum E epsilon and then integrating over my initial uh, distribution. So F0, 10 N times, and integrating in phase space. Okay, so if you take the ex expectation, it means you're integrating against the initial distribution. Okay. If it's Hn, it will be Hn here, whatever. Okay, so here, uh, what I'm computing at the bottom of my slide is uh, the empirical distribution. I'm taking the average. And then by definition, it's equal to the, the integral of H, the, the, my test function, against the one particle correlation function. If I define the n particle correlation function, I'm just taking an empirical distribution for n particles, okay? And this defines the n particle correlation function. And in terms of my initial distribution, w, it just means I'm taking my w at n particles, n plus one, n plus two, et cetera, until infinity, summing over all possibilities, remembering I had this uh, symmetry, okay? So I divide by one over factorial p, and then I normalize, okay? This one over mu is the same as the one here. Okay, so if you know W, you know all n particle correlation functions for any n, just by this formula, and it tells you exactly how particles are correlated by definition. Okay, now to find the Boltzmann equation, we want to take the limit of the one particle correlation function. Okay, and here's a theorem. If you look at this one particle correlation function, then it does converge in the limit epsilon goes to zero, meaning u epsilon goes to infinity, to the solution to the Boltzmann equation with an initial data f0, which was the distribution of my initial particles. Okay, And that's uniform on a small of order one, let's say, time interval. And the only assumptions you need on the initial data is that it's continuous in space and uh, bounded by a Gaussian in velocities. So that's exactly a Lanford's theorem. Actually, he proves more than that. He also proves that if you look at the n particle correlation function, Okay, then as epsilon goes to zero, this n particle correlation functions converges to simply a product of n times the solution of the Boltzmann equation, a tensor product. Meaning that when epsilon goes to zero, all my particles become independent, which of course is not true when epsilon is fixed. But when epsilon goes to zero, when the number of particles goes to infinity, then they all behave as though they were independent. So you have just n copies of the Boltzmann equation. Right for the same uh, for the, the same um, time span. Right, so that's uh, Lanford's theorem, and let me just uh, show you uh, in, uh, just in two or three slides how you prove this result and uh, why the time is so short. Okay, so remember uh, he wants to prove what the one particle correlation function uh, uh, converges to, but actually uh, we'll see in a second. You actually need to understand all the correlation functions at the same time. And so what you're going to do is just write down the equation for the one particle or the n particle correlation function. And that's easy enough since you know exactly the equation on W, just a transport equation with a boundary term. Okay, so you just take this, this transport equation integrated against all the variables uh, you have here. Okay, you work a little bit and you find this equation here. So on the right, the left-hand side, you just have the transport of my n particles, which is expected. And on the right-hand side, you have the fact that my particles are going to meet once in a while. Okay, so particle uh, i, let's say, uh, 
is going at some point to touch another particle. That's a boundary term. Okay, when you take the uh, the um, when you take an integral of the transport equation, at some point you're going to have a boundary term. Okay, and the boundary is going to say one particle, say i, is touching another one. Which other one? Well, let's say n plus one. They're all the same anyway. Okay, and that's exactly this term c epsilon n n plus one. One particle i is touching particle n plus one. It's touching it, you can see it because particle n plus one is sitting exactly at xi plus epsilon times something on the sphere. So that's exactly xn plus one minus xi is equal to epsilon. Okay, and then either my particles are incoming and then nothing happens, or they're outgoing. If they're outgoing, that means I have a plus sign here. Remember the, I told you when there, when there was a plus sign, you had to use a boundary condition. And so if there's a plus sign here, you have to change vi w, which is just a velocity I'm integrating again. Uh, against, I had to change them into the V primes. Okay, so there's nothing to prove here. You just compute, use the boundary condition, and you get this hierarchy of equations. You see, even the, the one particle correlation function depends on the two particle correlation functions. So if you if you want to understand f epsilon one, you have to understand f epsilon two. So that's why you have to write down the whole hierarchy of equations. Okay, now can I take a limit in this equation? Well, the idea of Lanford is to say write the same equation in a duml form. So s epsilon here is just a transport of n particles with collisions, okay? And this is just a duml formulation. And the idea of Lanford is to say this f, f, epsilon n plus one also satisfies a transport equation with the right-hand side. So I can again plug in a duml formulation in this guy here, okay? And I'll get something with f epsilon n plus two. And I can plug it in again and again and again. So and again, you get, in the end, you get the series here. Okay, where each term of the series is telling me essentially I've transported once, collided once, transported again, collided again, blah, 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 until you arrive to the initial data. Okay, and you have a series here. Okay, it's an infinite term, infinite series. You can have only one term or two if you replace this by the transport of the initial data, or three if you do the next UML term, et cetera, et cetera. And so what's nice about this formula is that it's relating the solution, the n particle correlation function at time t to the n plus m particle correlation function at time zero. So it's an exact formula. I know what happens is at time zero, I know what happens at time t, okay? The only problem here, of course, is you have to check the series converges. And then the idea is to take a limit in the series and find something which looks like Boltzmann. Is that okay? So, I need to check the series it converges, and I need to check that each term converges to something which will give me the Boltzmann equation. And so the idea is the following. Let's just look at this series and try to remember what uh, each term looks like. So S is just a transport term. I can forget it. It's continuous in L infinity, for instance. So just forget about that. It's continuous. This uh, collision term, however, has a cost, right? Because remember, this guy was a sum from I equal to what, from 1 to N of some integral. So it costs N. Okay, this n here is exactly the sum. Each of these terms has a size n. And then if you remember, the integral also costs velocities because I integrated v minus v1 or v minus w. So it costs some v. But okay, I don't want to forget, I don't want to mind too much about that. Everything will be computed in a Gaussian norm. So every power of v will just be eaten up in the end by a Gaussian. So I don't really mind about this v. I'm more worried about this n here. Why? Because if I go on, each of these guys costs uh, n plus 1, n plus 2, et cetera, to n plus m. So each of the collision term is, terms is going to produce this factor here. Okay, so essentially it's like a factorial m, which is not too good if I want to sum over m. Now, the good news is that I'm integrating in time. I am integrating against the simplex in time. Okay, so the factorial m, which came from the collision terms, is eating, eaten up by this simplex here. Okay, so it's not too bad. At least the factorial is gone. And now if I put everything together, if I have a weighted norm in the velocities just to eat up all those uh, powers of V, then I see essentially the size of this integral here is a constant times time, which is here, to an M, to the M for each fixed N. Okay, and that's exactly why Lanford has a short time because you need this to be converging in M, okay? If I had an alpha here, if I had left alpha, then the alpha would be here. And t would be like one over alpha. Okay, so the short time existence of Lanford is just because he needs the series to converge in m. Once you've done that, then you can start taking limits as epsilon goes to zero. 
And what happens is that my collision term, remember I had uh, my xn plus one was xi plus epsilon omega. When epsilon goes to zero, I just converge to a pointwise interaction, which is exactly what happens with, uh, with uh, Boltzmann, so that's fine. Then my initial data, I know what it is. Remember, I had this tensor product with the um, exclusion condition, but if n is fixed and I let epsilon go, go to zero, then the exclusion just converges to one. And so my initial data does converge to a tensor product for each fixed m. And since my series converges, I can just prove each term separately converges. Okay, so m is fixed here, everything is fixed, and this does converge to a tensor product. And finally, uh, I need to, to let the flow converge to something. And that's uh, sort of the tricky part because this flow here is a flow with collisions, right? Particles see each other all the time. And what you have to prove if you want to guarantee my particles stay independent, and if you want to guarantee that the Boltzmann equation holds, is that there are no recollision and this converges to free flow. And free flow is the left-hand side of the Boltzmann equation. Okay, so the last thing you have to do is to convert to, to prove that this um, transport term with lots of recollisions, particles keep seeing each other all the time, converges to a transport when, when two particles see each other, then they'll never see each other again. They won't even see particles that have seen particles that have seen particles that have seen them again, okay? They really need to be independent for any future time. And then once you've done that, then you just conclude by uniqueness. I have the tensor product initial data. I check that the Boltzmann equation solves this hierarchy. And then by uniqueness argument, I prove that everything is fine. I convert to the solution to the Boltzmann equation. Okay, so that's just in a nutshell, uh, the proof of Lanford's theorem. Now, just one comment here, Irreversi irreversibility comes from the recollisions. Because if two particles recollide, when time goes forward, if you move back, the first recollision is actually a collision. So what I want to remove in forward time, I want to keep in backward time. So there's really a way of understanding the proof of Lanford exactly as, a, well, understanding precisely where irreversibility comes in in the proof. Even the statement, you can write it down as a totally irreversible statement in some sense. Okay, and that's just a, a side comment. And again, as I said, uh, it's short time because collision trees are growing, right? I have this, uh, uh, this CT to the M because I have no control in the collision trees. And just uh, uh, no control over M, right? So uh, there's some problem here. And you can notice that even if my initial data is at equilibrium, I have no way of making this proof any better. But what I told you to in, uh, in the previous slides was for, was for any initial data. And even if the initial data is equilibrium, I don't know how to use that information to make uh, Lanford theorem better. Okay, so there's really something to understand, which for the moment we don't we don't know how to do in general. Okay, so again, what I want to do now, uh, just in the rest of the talk, is to try to go back and understand more precisely this limit, to understand better what's going on behind this limit, and maybe one day uh, improve, even in short times will be, uh, today will be for short times, maybe uh, one day in longer times, the convergence result. So one way of understanding uh, Boltzmann's theorem is by a law of large numbers. Okay, so I have this empirical distribution here, and one way of understanding it is that this distribution converges to the solution of the Boltzmann equation in some sense. More precisely, let me compute the difference between the empirical distribution and its expected value in expectation. Okay, so let's compute the variance. Okay, so to do that, I just blow up the square here. So the first term is just pi squared, those two first terms. Pi squared is either with two same indices, which is the first term, or two different ones, which is the second one. And then minus this guy here, which is, uh, of course, uh, uh, expectation is equal to itself. Okay, and then remember what correlation functions are. The first term here is just the one particle correlation function computed against h squared, whereas the second term is exactly the two particle correlation function. Okay, by definition, which we saw a long time ago. Okay, so you see here I've gained a one over epsilon because I had a squared here. So this term just goes to zero. And then if I believe uh, Lanford, Lanford is telling me that f epsilon two looks like at the limit f tensor f. Okay, which means this integral is actually a square of two integrals, which cancels exactly with this guy here, which is exactly the square at the limit. Okay, so at the limit, 
this first term cancels with the second one, so everything goes to zero. Is that okay? Right, so in other words, you can see this, uh, just translate that by some kind of uh, Markov inequality, you can translate that into a lot of large numbers. Okay. Now, if I want to go beyond that, a natural question is, what does the fluctuation field look like? So if I, as usual, I expect the fluctuations just means I multiply everything by the, by the average, okay, uh, one, uh, to the power one half, which means instead of taking uh, this, which I just computed before, I multiply everything by square root of the average number of particles. Okay, so I zoom very strongly and I want to know what happens to this in the limit, right? Does this have a limit? Is it the good scaling? If it does, what's the limit? So, um, right, it's an exercise, which maybe I won't do right now because I might take a little bit too much time, about five minutes probably of my time. But it's really an exercise to check that initially, with the initial data I gave myself, this uh, fluctuation field converges to a Gaussian white noise. And the vari variance is just computing F0 against H squared, or the covariance, the variance, okay? That's a, uh, really an exercise. That's just one way of proving it, it's just computing this, uh, this exponential here, the expect expected value, and it's an exercise to see you get this. So it is the right scaling, because initially it's exactly what you expect. This, uh, this square root of mu is the right scaling, because initially you do get a Gaussian white noise. Okay, so now the question is what happens as time evolves? Can, do I have an equation for this guy or uh, for its limit as epsilon goes to zero? Can I understand fluctuations around the Boltzmann equation? So uh, here's the theorem. So that's something we got with um, Laure Thierry and um, Sergio. And what we prove is that there is a limit uh, to the fluctuation fields, which converges in law to some kind of fluctuation field, which satisfies a fluctuating Boltzmann equation, which is written just here. So let me just explain a little bit what it looks like. So the first term of my equation is a linear term, which is just linearizing the Boltzmann equation against the solution to the Boltzmann equation. Okay, so I have my initial data, which was a co n copies of F0. That produces a solution to the Boltzmann equation F. And the operator here, LT, is the linearized Boltzmann operator around F. Okay, and the transport term, of course. So if, if I didn't have this noise here, I would just say, well, everything's fine. Actually, my initial fluctuation field just satisfies the linearized Boltzmann equation, which is to be expected in looking at fluctuations. So that's uh, essentially to be expected. But actually, that's not what happens. What happens is that you have a noise, which is added to your problem, and the noise actually comes from re-collisions. Why? Because the, so this noise is uh, Gaussian also, white in space and time, but it's co correlated in velocities. And you see you're having here two copies of F computed at the same position, Okay, so it's really a collision term or re-collision term, right? So you have two Fs, two, two particles, both are um, following the, the law of F and they collide at some points, X1, right? And then what you get here is the fluctuation fields with the covariance, you have two copies of H computed also essentially just you know, through the scattering rules. Okay, I, won't, I can't go through that uh, too much, but uh, this term is really due to re-collisions. Okay, and so this theorem actually was uh, conjectured by Spohn uh, quite a long time ago. There was a proof by Rezan Kalu when you had a discrete velocity uh, model at equilibrium. And the limit equation for the covariance was known, that equation was known at equilibrium uh, uh, quite a long time ago for short times. And then more recently, we got that for all times for the covariance uh, at equilibrium. Here we have something out of equilibrium, F0 is anything, and so, Okay, so that was the, the first result I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, and uh, in the time that's left, maybe I'll say a little bit better about, uh, about the proof as well. So we do get an equation for the covariance and also actually for the whole fluctuation field. And so the, the question that usually comes after that is what happens to large deviations, right? I mean, I know exactly what happens to fluctuations. Can we go all the way in some sense and understand large deviations? Large deviations is what? It's, uh, okay, I know the Boltzmann equation. What's the probability that my empirical distribution is something totally different, another function phi? Okay, is that, can that happen? And you have large deviations, of course, if you get some functional depending on phi, such that this probability is given by this formula here. Okay, and so uh, it is true. So the theorem is telling you that exactly that, that the probability of having a different path, 
than uh, the, the Boltzmann solution, okay, is given by this uh, large deviation functional, which, okay, there are lots of ways of understanding it, but one way of seeing it is a Legendre transform, where, uh, so it's taken with, with respect to paths H and some set B I want to talk about here, okay. So a Legendre transform taking a sup norm, a sup over uh, all kinds of paths H, of the genre transform of some guy uh, J, which I'll be defining in seconds, and the genre in the sense that either you're looking at your test function at a final time t, okay, so you're looking at the integral of phi against h at some final time t, or the whole path of phi and the transport of h. So that's your essentially your scalar products in the Legendre transform of this function i, and i satisfy uh, infinite dimensional Hamilton Jacobi equation which I won't go into uh, unless you ask me to, but just you can look at it from very far. It's uh, a hamilton jacobi equation. Gamma here is the exponential of h at time t. And the only thing that's maybe interesting here is that actually this functional f is exactly the one Reza Kalu had found again in 98 for a 1D stochastic dynamics. So here we have a deterministic system initially of particles, but you get exactly the same um, large deviation functional as if you had a stochastic problem initially, which is maybe uh, surprising in some sense. And Boucher had expected that actually uh, last year for hard spheres, and that's uh, actually what we proved. Okay, so now maybe I have just a few minutes left, if uh, if that's okay. To and I, of course I won't I won't show you the precise proofs, but I just want to show you the key uh, objects which we've, we, we've been working on to understand, uh, to prove those results. And then I'll stop there. I, I want to take more of your time, but just to show you what the, the important object is. And to understand that, I, I don't want to, to look at all the moments. I mean, one way of proving, that's actually the way we prove things, of proving this uh, fluctuation field converges to a Gaussian field is computing all the moments, okay? And so you f first you can compute the second one, just to start with. And so what you do compared with the previous computation I made before when I wanted to prove uh, the law of large numbers, is just multiply my previous computation, which you maybe recognize here, by mu epsilon, right? Because I have a square. Fluctuation field is square root of mu epsilon times what I'd computed before. And so I used to have a one over mu, now I have one here, and I used to have a one here, now I have a mu, right? So of course this guy doesn't converge directly to anything, okay? Uh, with respect to the compute computation I'd made before. So, let me, get, let me understand what those things are. So what I do know is that f epsilon one converges to the Boltzmann equation. So I'm, I, I'm not worried at all about the first term. It doesn't go to zero, but it goes to something I know. What I'm more worried about is the second term here. And the second term, of course, is precisely a fluctuation. It's telling you the difference between a two-point correlation function and twice the one-point correlation function. Okay, that's exactly what you should expect. That's really where um, fluctuations are appearing. Also, the difference between a two-point correlation function and the tensor product of two one-point correlation functions. And this, by definition, is what we call the order two cum cumulant. Okay, a cumulant is exactly extracting from a correlation function all the lower order correlations. Okay, and what I want to understand, if I want the limit of the second moment, is to understand the limit of the first order cumulant that I know, it's Boltzmann, and especially the second order cumulant, okay? And as you can expect, those guys are gonna satisfy equations, but it's again a hierarchy of equations. So I need to understand all the cumulants, right? So what's a cumulant, uh, if you've never seen them before, well, essentially, if, uh, if I look just at the exclusion at time zero, all I know my part is my particles are far away one from the other. If two particles are far away, I can say that's equal to one minus their two of them are close. If three particles are far, far away, that's one minus two are close and the other one I don't know, plus the three are close. Okay, and then all, of course, uh, since my particles have labels that I don't know, I have to put some combinatorics on top of that. That's exactly this definition. Okay, one minus plus, that's what I was saying before, some combinatorics, and then correlation functions at lower orders. So, okay, this is a horrible formula, but it's a definition, okay? You can inverse this formula and then you can recover uh, correlation functions from cumulants. All that is very well known. It's really nothing very, very new here. The only thing that's interesting is that a cumulant, uh, which is not the case, of course, for a correlation function, are supported, supported exactly on clusters. I have a cumulant of order n, that means I have n particles that see each other. They're close in some sense, 
So what we need to understand to prove our theorem is to understand as time evolves, how are my uh, correlation functions ex uh, written in terms of cumulants? So this very sketchy uh, drawing is telling you exactly that. If I give myself lots of particles at time t, I'm going to look at them at time t. I want to know if they're correlated or not. OK, so I look at their collision trees. Either they touch, that means that they're correlated, or they don't. OK, exactly as I said before, three particles are far. That's equal to 1 minus 2 or close plus 3 or close. OK, and that's exactly what we're going to do at time t. And I guess I'll stop it in just on one side. OK, so it's just a bit more patience. I think the only thing important here, maybe, uh, which took us a lot of time, so we're very happy about this estimate, is having an estimate on the correlation functions, exactly like uh, Lanford had on his, I'm sorry, on the cumulants. Lanford had an estimate on the correlation functions. We get an estimate on cumulants, which look a lot like Lanford, OK, c to the n, t to the n. And they cost this factorial n with respect to Lanford, but you can't expect anything better. It's uh, probably optimal. And this factorial n is actually a miracle, and that's the one that gives us, well, no, we're very happy to get it. And it's thanks to that that we can sum cumulants and in the end get a large deviations principle. But I won't talk about that now. I just want to explain how to conclude for the fluctuation th uh, theorem. So the fluctuation theorem, as I said, for time zero, what you do is compute the exponential, then take the expected value, maybe take a log, and then see what happens. What you want to do in the end is just get uh, a contribution of f1 and f2, just like we did before, um, for the uh, just for the time, like for the time zero case. So that works actually because what you get just just a formula again. This is an easy formula. What you get here is a sum of cumulants. Okay, the first term looks very bad because you have a square root of mu here, a mu here. But if you expand the exponential, you get a square root of mu. So the f1 cancels out with this one. Then if you expand exponential again, you get a 1 over mu with the, with the f2, which is important. And then if you go on with the expansion, the terms are small because you get powers, negative powers of mu. So in the end, all I need to compute is the limit of f epsilon 1, which I know, it's Boltzmann, and the limit of epsilon 2. And I'll stop here with this drawing. And this is where I'll stop, I promise. So what I just said, you can just write it down as this equation. This you can believe me, and uh, the exponential when you expand it, everything else will be small. You only get the, the contribution, sorry, typo here of F2 and F1. F1 converges to Boltzmann, and I'll stop explaining where F2 converges to. So cumulant of order two is saying, I'm looking at two particles at time t. I want to know if they have been connected in the past. The only way for two particles to be connected is via recollision, okay, which is here. I don't know when the recollision appears. It's some random time. Okay, and that's exactly the noise in the Boltzmann equation, in the in the fluctuation, the limit fluctuation equation. If I take two particles at time, uh, lots of particles at time zero, they're following the Boltzmann equation. That means that my fluctuation field is following a linearized Boltzmann equation. Whenever two particles meet, right, they've never seen each other before, and they all follow the Boltzmann equation. Okay, so everything's fine. Things got, could start getting wrong at some random time. That's why I have a right-hand side of my equation. I don't know when that happens. At some random time, two particles get correlated, and this produces an F2. And this is exactly the right-hand side of my um, fluctuation field equation at the limit. OK, uh, so I guess I'll stop here because uh, my time is up. And uh, right, so thanks for your attention. And I'm happy to answer any question. Thanks very much.